This is the Galaxy S23 Ultra. And as far as the premium market goes, in the Android world at least, this is just about, if not the outright most premium phone that you can get right now. It has literally all the bells and whistles you could hope to find in a phone. But here's the thing, you can have every damn bell and whistle that you like, but a phone can still fall flat on its face if all those bells and whistles have not been implemented with care and consideration. And so two months after this phone's release, after a bunch of software updates and after an extended period using this phone, I'm finally bringing you my full in-depth review that aims to answer the question, have Samsung made a phone worthy of its price tag? So let's dive in. Now, in the interest of saving just a little bit of time with this review, I'm only gonna briefly discuss the aspects of this phone that in my mind are similar to last year's S22 Ultra and save the meat of this review for the areas that are either significantly different or that are at least worth talking about at length. And for me, I reckon there are five key areas that are almost identical between this and last year's devices. The first of which being the design, with almost everything being the same, save for the ever so slightly less curved display and the slightly more boxier sides. And yes, whilst I do like that it now has less of a curved display, in real world use, there is still a pretty noticeable difference between using the display on this phone compared to using a properly flat display, like the ones found on the iPhones or the Nothing Phone 1, for example. But aside from that subtle change, everything else is almost exactly the same as last year's phone, which itself was super premium. So of course, this phone feels super premium as well. The only aspect I am disappointed didn't get an update was this larger than expected chin on the bottom of the display. And when you consider that iPhones have had consistently sized bezels since the iPhone 10, or the fact that even Samsung's cheaper S23 has evenly sized and very minimally sized bezels, it really makes me wonder why on earth Samsung haven't yet managed to sort this out on their highest end device. My leading theory, it's that S Pen. And to be honest, even though I hardly use this thing, if I had to choose between a smaller bezel or having an S Pen, then I'd actually choose the S Pen every time. And so whilst we're chatting about it, I may as well mention that this is another key area that is pretty much identical compared to last year's S Pen in that it's fast, accurate, and really satisfying to use. And so it's hard to blame Samsung for making no changes here when it feels like they've already reached the limit of how good the S Pen can be. And then there's the display. And again, basically everything I said about the S22 Ultra's display last year is almost the exact same here with the S23 Ultra. It's super sharp, it's really fluid, and it also gets really bright in direct sunlight. Though I will say it's definitely not quite the brightest display on the market anymore with the latest iPhone 14 Pro lineup and even the recent Oppo Find X6 Pro having even brighter displays. And just to add two more components to the mix of aspects that really haven't changed between this and last year's models, the haptics and the fingerprint sensor are again imperceptibly identical between the two phones. And that is by no means a bad thing given how amazing the haptics and the fingerprint sensor were on last year's device. But I definitely feel like Samsung could have been a little bit bolder here by including a larger fingerprint scanner to match those found on some other high-end flagships like Vivo's top-end phones and so forth. That would have been really cool. Okay, before we chat about the main changes with this phone, if you've bought yourself a brand new Galaxy S23 Ultra and you're wanting to keep it in pristine condition, then you should totally check out one of the many incredible options from today's video sponsor, Case to Fire. And that's because their cases offer not just military grade level protection, but actually five times the level of military grade protection thanks to this EcoShop lining found within each of their cases. Like if you're someone who's particularly prone to dropping phones, then that is something you do not have to worry about at all with these cases. And thanks to that level of protection, which also features these slightly raised lips that protect the screen and the cameras, I was happy to do this drop test on concrete with my only review unit of this phone. And there was no damage at all anywhere on the phone following the test. 
All of their cases are made from recyclable materials and there are a staggering amount of design options available, including a bunch of these high profile collabs like with the Mandalorian series, Alice in Wonderland, and even Harry Potter. And if that wasn't enough, you can also customize your case to make it completely unique and one of a kind. So to pick one up for yourself, use the special link below to get a handy 15% off today. All right, so from there, let's chat about how Samsung has improved this phone over last year's S22 Ultra. The first area of which being the battery life. Last year, I found the battery life on the S22 Ultra to be solid, but still definitely nothing to write home about. Well, this year, Samsung have upped their game big time. And that's thanks in large part to the new Snapdragon Gen 2 chipset, which is thankfully found in all versions of this phone, not just the US variant. But this chipset is known to have fantastic optimization and efficiency when it comes to battery life. And so when you pair that with some other under the hood changes, what you end up with is really impressive battery life. For example, with my Galaxy S22 Ultra, which by the way, had the Exynos chipset inside, I was finishing most days with the battery sitting at around 20 to 30%. But with the Galaxy S23 Ultra, I've finished a lot of days closer to and oftentimes over that 50% mark. And for me, that actually puts this phone ahead of the iPhone 14 Pro in terms of battery life, which is a super impressive feat. And then the second area that has seen a huge improvement over last year's device has been in the software and performance department. Again, this is largely thanks to the much more powerful Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 chipset that's being used alongside improved RAM, which by the way, allows this phone to hold way more apps in memory, way longer than any other phone I've used in recent times. But the big change Samsung have made with this phone that I think has had the biggest impact as to how fluid and smooth it feels is in relation to the improved animations Samsung have implemented across the entire user experience. So for context, this phone ships with One UI 5.1 based on Android 13. And let me tell you, this might just be, no, scratch that. This is the biggest upgrade Samsung has ever released in relation to their software. You see, for years, despite their phones always having the best specs available, the software never felt quite as fluid as other versions of Android, where it always felt as though there was this additional layer in between your finger and the phone's display that caused this slight delay in interaction. It's really hard to describe, but if you've ever used a Pixel or an iPhone side by side with an older Samsung phone, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But praise be, Samsung have finally changed something under the hood, meaning that problem is no longer present on this phone. Now, I've seen some people online saying that this change has made the Galaxy S23 lineup the most fluid software experience on the market, right in line with iOS. But for me, it's still not quite as fluid as the software experience you get on Pixel phones or phones running AOSP-based versions of Android. But I do have to tip my hat to Samsung as they've made significant leaps and bounds in the software department with this phone, which I for one am incredibly grateful about. The thing is though, One UI 5.1 has been shipping to older Samsung phones since the S23 lineup was released, and it is also helping them to feel a lot smoother as well. So this very welcome improvement isn't just limited to this phone, which is definitely something to keep in mind. Now, there is one final aspect of this phone that I haven't talked about yet, and that's because it is one of the most confusing aspects for a plethora of reasons, and I am of course referring to the cameras. Now, I say confusing mainly because Samsung spent a huge amount of time during the launch event chatting about the significant upgrades this phone received in the camera department, but in reality, the changes feel very minor and hardly noticeable. And that's because the phone features almost the exact same camera configuration as last year's device with the only differences being that the main camera is now a 200 megapixel shooter up from last year's 108 megapixel shooter. And the selfie shooter is now a 12 megapixel shooter down from last year's 40 megapixel shooter. But unless you manually switch to using the 200 megapixel mode, then you're still ending up with binned 12 megapixel images that look very similar in comparison to photos from last year's main sensor as well. And even if you do use that 200 megapixel mode, whilst yes, you will preserve a heck of a lot more detail in the final images, 
Firstly, the file sizes are huge as a result. And secondly, Samsung's impressive processing isn't quite as evident in the final results as well. So unless you're planning to print your images or heavily edit them, then I would suggest using any mode but the 200 megapixel mode. And then the rest of the camera experience also feels nearly identical between this and last year's devices as well. You still have that beautiful combo of the 3X and 10X telephoto lenses, which are for me, my favorite lenses to use. And even though I rarely use the feature anymore, I reckon Samsung's portrait mode is one of the best on the market right now. Now, one thing I will say is that for the majority of the time that I've been using this phone, I've actually been using Samsung's good lock module called Camera Assistant to increase capture speed. But as a result, I actually think this has caused a lot of my images to look a little underwhelming, so much so that I would actually suggest avoiding using this feature at all costs. And the other thing I've noticed is how much image quality suffers when shooting in darker environments where there's still a bright part of the image visible in the shot. Take these photos I captured at an Alice in Wonderland exhibition we took our kids to, or even these photos I captured on a walk around my neighborhood around a month ago. And as far as I'm concerned, these photos are barely usable to me. You get this big blocky grain evident across almost every visible part of the images. And yet there's also very little detail preserved even in the brighter part of the images. So whether Samsung needs to improve when their night mode functionality automatically switches on or just improve their processing of these sorts of images in general, I'm not sure. But for me, I was pretty disappointed with these shots. Oh, and the other improvement Samsung spoke at length about in regards to their camera system this year was the upgrades they've made to the stabilization system. And whilst you can definitely tell that videos are way more stable, which looks particularly great in combination with the main lens and even the 3X telephoto lens, when shooting with the 10X lens, videos tend to look quite a bit more artifacty with these visual stutters evident as a result of that stabilization having to work extra hard. And I actually reckon this has resulted in slightly worse looking videos from that 10X lens in comparison to videos captured using the 10X lens on last year's S22 Ultra, which is such a shame because this is normally the lens I love shooting video with the most. Look, all that to say, whilst I've definitely enjoyed the experience of using the entire camera array on this phone, as I did very much so with last year's S22 Ultra, I feel like I found it harder to get the same really impressive and consistent results this time around. And yet, despite all of that, and despite the fact that this phone is still very similar to last year's Galaxy S22 Ultra, I still consider it to be just about my favorite ultra premium phone available right now. If you already have an S22 Ultra, then you can sleep quite comfortably knowing that you're using almost the exact same phone with slightly worse battery performance, but perhaps improved camera quality. But if you're in the market for an upgrade and you're looking to spend big, well, this phone offers you just about everything you could hope for in a flagship phone. With that being said, I do think Samsung is well overdue now to make some more splashier upgrades with this entire lineup next year. But until then, hats off to Samsung for another incredible ultra phone. <laughs>